Okay. Um, hello there, everybody. This is uh, David Sale, the Sage Cataloging Specialist. And uh, what you're looking at here is the uh, start of a PowerPoint on uh, RDA uh, theory and vocabulary. This is an uh, edited version, a shortened version of the original uh, PowerPoint deck, which was, as you'll see here, originally prepared by Magda L. Sherbini at Ohio State for a uh, American Library Association online class on, on RDA. Um, if folks are interested, we can make the complete PowerPoint and others um, with it available. Uh, they haven't yet gone up on the um, SAGE staff website because I need to get permission before reposting them. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about RDA and what it all means. And one of the things to explain is that RDA actually comes from something called FERBR, F-R-B-R, Functional Requirements for Bibliographic Records. And the idea behind this is that in the 21st century digital world, it's been or become necessary to rethink a little bit about how a library catalog works. And traditionally, library catalogs worked using uh, three by five cards. Now it's all uh, a computer database. And so the way that we think about creating records in the database uh, has to change slightly. So moving ahead to the next slide here, if I can. Right, there we go. So, um, this started with the, uh, the need to map out what the library catalog is trying to accomplish. And the tasks that a user engages in when they turn to the catalog to locate a book or some other library resource. So these tasks are, first of all, to find something corresponding to their query to identify it as being a particular resource as opposed to another particular one, and then to select from among the different resources that they have found and obtain it finally, either from the shelf or uh, via a hold or interlibrary loan or what have you. And so these are the tasks that a, a patron is performing when they use the library catalog and therefore it's our uh, job as catalogers to facilitate this process and to make sure that it is as easy as possible for patrons to complete. So along with this understanding of the, uh, the goals of having a library catalog. Um, the Ferber introduced a uh, idea called the entity relationship model, and we're gonna be talking more about that in the next few slides. Basically, the entity relationship model uh, starts with the recognition that we talk about a book or another library resource, when we talk about a book as, you know, it has a title and it has an author and it has a subject, but these are not really qualities that a book has the same way that it has a cover and X number of pages. So the entity relationship model is the recognition that when we think of authors and the subjects they write about, and the titles of the books that they've written, that these are entities and they exist in a relationship to each other. And this is something that the library catalog tries to capture. Uh, one way that it does so is using authority files, that we have approved keywords for uh, 
subjects and we have uh, approved forms of authors' names and we have a list of cross-references between them to take us from Mark Twain to Samuel Clemens or from cooking to baking to event planning, let's say. And so these relationships and attributes are what we're going to talk about here in the next few slides. Okay, so um, Ferber starts by redefining some of the traditional terms that we use in cataloging. Um, it sets up group one, group two, and group three entities, and the definitions for them are here. A uh, group one entity is the product of an intellectual or artistic endeavor. Another way to say that is that group one entities are library resources. They're containers of information. But RDA uh, examines that in a little bit different way that, you know, you can have information in a physical container, but you can also have an information resource sort of independent of one. So uh, it introduces the concepts or the levels of work, expression, manifestation, and item. You distinguish between these. We'll talk more about uh, what those are in the, in the next few slides. Group two entities are those who are responsible for generating information content. Um, generally, we would talk about authors, but um, authors is a word that applies mainly to books. So uh, RDA vocabulary broadens that out to creators and to contributors, the idea being that a creator is responsible for a work of art or literature or scholarship, what have you, and contributors assist the expression of that work. Uh, one common example, the author of a children's book would be considered a creator, but the illustrator would be a contributor. The group three, then is loosely defined subjects. And we're familiar with uh, subject headings and uh, subjects of books, but in RDA, they define that out a little more, in a little more detailed fashion so that uh, you can have as subjects a concept, object, event, or place. Also, then you can have a uh, person or another book, another information resource be the subject of a, uh, so if, for instance, if you have a book of movie reviews or a book of criticism or a, uh, a guide to a uh, you know guide to Harry Potter or something like that. Those are examples of where the subject of an oh, information resource is another information resource. And we can kind of visualize this here in this flow chart. Um, so we have an individual, a family, or a corporate body, all three of which can be considered creators in different ways. And an example here might be motion pictures. Um, corporate bodies like movie studios tend to have a major share of responsibility in the creation of a movie. Uh, a family also uh, can be, or another sort of, uh, another sort of uh, association. So um, then, when we look at um, the difference between work, expression, manifestation, and item, we're moving from the more general to the more particular, and we're also moving from the initial act of creation in through to uh, the production of a physical object that contains information. So we're going to look at how that works here as we define 
these terms work, expression, manifestation, and item. Um, so a work is uh, a resource in its broadest sense. It's something that has a subject, which whether that's a, a person, a, a place or thing, or another resource, and also has a uh, creator and a um, generally has an expression or a manifestation. So, for example, uh, if you work is generally defined as the relationship between two entities, those being the group one entity and the group two entity, or as we would put it, between the author and the work that is known by a particular title. So Hamlet by William Shakespeare is a work, or Moby Dick uh, by Herman Melville is a work. And a translation, uh, abridgments, illustrated versions, etc., etc., um, these are all different examples, or as we would call them, different expressions of the same work. Whereas um, when something becomes adapted to a too great of a degree, uh, it is considered a different work. Generally, we draw the line at um, when a book gets turned into a movie, that is considered to be a different work, whereas an audiobook is a different expression of the same work. It is, instead of the book being presented as text, it's the book, it's the text of the book being read out loud. Whereas with the movie, you have the text of the book gets cut up and recombined into the text of the movie script, which then gets filmed. And so it's a more extensive adaptation. Um, a parody of something also goes beyond the original text. Uh, reviews, evaluations, criticism, commentary, all of these are a separate work, related possibly because they have the, as, the, as the subject of this work, they have the original work. Um, when do we consider something to be a similar expression or a different expression then? So, yeah, the issue here hinges on intellectual content. So to return to the original example, um, an audiobook on CD or on cassette uh, has the same intellectual content as the book in print. Often, uh, an audiobook is a word-for-word -word, uh, transformation from printed text into spoken English. And so that is an example of two different expressions of the same work. Um, reprints or uh, other simultaneous publications. So different um, editions of a book. The, the, the expression of a book in print is one expression. And uh, however, if the text of the book then is revised or edited or added to in another edition, um, then it may become a different expression. And here's where I want to stop for a second and point out that edition is a slippery concept. Um, RDA in defining um, work expression and manifestation and item, which we'll get to in a minute, um, none of those categories directly correspond to an edition as that word is used in book publishing. And the reason for that is that at times an edition can simply be a, a new 
manifestation, a new physical form of a prior expression, or it can be a new expression. So when we look at, for instance, a nonfiction book that gets republished in a revised edition or a second edition, or any other situation where we find new supplementary material being added or older, now incorrect information being changed or removed, or that kind of, uh, of edition is considered a different expression because it affects the intellectual content. Whereas when a book comes out in uh, paperback, that is a different manifestation, but not necessarily a different expression. The physical form has changed, but the information between the two covers of the book remains exactly as it was. Um, likewise, an audiobook on cassette versus on CD is uh, a change in format and therefore considered a different manifestation. But the audiobook itself, uh, if it is the same on both formats, remains the same expression. Uh, however, if an audiobook were to be released in an abridged edition, quote unquote, that abridgment then creates a new expression than the unabridged version. So we have here the work, which is the, uh, the idea, you might say, the work sort of exists in an abstract sense. It does not have a physical existence until it is expressed and when it is expressed, whether as text or as sound or as video or what have you, uh, a work of art can be or expressed as a picture or a sculpture even. Uh, so you have an expression, but then that expression is also generally a particular manifestation. So it's not until we start talking about a manifestation that we're really considering an information resource as a physical object, a book on a shelf. So then from the manifestation, um, we finally have oh, the item. And I'm getting ahead of myself. So the, the item um, is, of course, the object that has the barcode on it. And when we uh, create a mark record in the database, usually we are describing a manifestation because we have one or more otherwise identical items that are attached to that record and distinguished by their barcodes. So in order to avoid duplication, and other errors in the catalog, though, we need to recognize which elements of the MARC record are not just recording the information specific to this manifestation, but which elements are actually uh, capturing information that is shared across different expressions or information that is pertaining to the work itself. And um, the next slide here, then, is kind of a map of how this works. At the left edge here, you'll have uh, examples of the same expression or equivalent expression, such as a microform reproduction, a facsimile, or a reprint. Um, then you may have different variations or versions, including translations, Simultaneous publication, in, for instance, it comes out in hardcover and paperback at the same time. It comes out with illustrations, etc. All of these are different expressions, but they remain the same work. Even when a work is abridged, it remains the same. But when it gets over into, as we've said, the cutoff point 
of uh, new or different intellectual content being added, um, such as a change of genre or style, including parodies, novelizations and or screenplays, you know, going back and forth across the divide of the book and the movie of the book, um, then it is considered to be a new work that is derivative of the old. And then we finally edge over into those works that are merely descriptive of other works, reviews, criticisms, evaluations, commentary. So there's a link here in that they share a subject, whereas if you're looking at something like a dramatization or a parody, they may share a title, they may share um, the involvement of some of the same creators, the original creator, and then the creator of the parody. So um, these are factors that we need to be aware of. Here's another sort of example of how you would move up or down the ladder from one uh, particular item to a work or back again. So on the left column here, let's take this one. So we have the work in question is A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. And it's no more than that. However, then, the expression of this work is a particular edition in English that was illustrated by Roberto Innocenti and then published, and at this point the expression becomes a manifestation, published in 1990 in New York by Stuart Tabori and Chang. Or then this particular expression of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens with illustrations by Roberto Innocenti may take on another manifestation when it is published by Creative Education in Mankato, Minnesota. So these are then two manifestations of the same expression of the same work. Whereas The Christmas Carol, um, a motion picture made in 1951, is a new work. Um, we may call it a, a, a derivative work because it's based on Charles Dickens' story, but as a motion picture in its own right, it is considered a new one. So um, it may then be expressed in a, a Spanish language dub for um, Hispanic viewers and then manifested as being uh, put out on home video in Mexico by, in 1998, or it may have a different manifestation being put out on DVD video at home in 2001. I don't know, but that's, that's just a, a guess. But you see then how the work travels from a uh, abstract, general existence into a particular physical object that was created in a specific location on a specific date. So when we consider what goes into a record, how is that broken down into um, these different levels? Now, as I said, generally when we create a MARC record, um, for an item in the library, we're working at the level of the manifestation. So we want to record the title, um, the statement of responsibility, which is the creator of the work and the contributors to it, uh, the location and the date and the name of the publisher, series statement, a description of this book or recording or whatever as a physical object, its size, its extent, um, so on and so forth. And then when we have this record, we can then attach the individual copies or items which have their own barcode, notes on their particular condition, etc. However, in creating the mark record for the manifestation, 
we are also pulling in information that would apply to other manifestations, possibly to other ex expressions of a particular work, and that therefore will share information with other records in the database. One example is the title. Um, often the title of the manifestation and the expression will be identical. Uh, other times you may have a shared title in which there is a specific title for the expression that is then shared among different manifestations. Uh, the form, and note the difference here between form and format. When we talk about um, a book being printed text versus an audio book being recorded sound, that's a form, that's text versus sound, but not a format, which is uh, cassette versus CD. We're already in the form of recorded sound, and now we're merely looking at the format of what method of storage you're using for the sound. Um, other elements of the expression may be the language in which it's been written or the language into which it's been translated. Uh, the date, if uh, a, a work has more than, or if a uh, particular expression has many manifestations, one way to uh, distinguish among them may be the date. Uh, an example of this might be movies with similar titles. Um, Ocean's Eleven, the movie. Well, there's actually, there's two. There was the one with George Clooney and Brad Pitt, but there was also an older movie called Ocean's Eleven with uh, Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and Sammy Davis Jr. So then the becomes a important means to distinguish between these two works. Um, and then we have as you can see, the uh, elements of the expression that are shared with the work, uh, title, form, date, and other distinguishing characteristics there. So how does this play out exactly in, in the entity relationship model? Well, here's an example of, what we, of a relationship. So we have an author and their work what we would call a group one and a group two entity. And this is only one common, but only one possible example of a relationship. We may also, as we've mentioned, have relationships between different works, um, relationship between a work and different expressions of that work, and so on and so forth. So, in taking these sort of con theoretical concepts here in Ferber and bringing them into RDA catalog, well, let's look at how that happens. So, when you have a brand new uh, book in your hand and you're putting the barcode sticker on it so it can be circulated, you're working with a group one item. Okay, or, and that's why we refer to item records in uh, Evergreen. And of course, Evergreen does this a little bit differently in that they have item and volume records, but those are essentially two halves of the same whole. Um, when you import or create a mark record, as I've said, that is supposed to represent a uh, manifestation so not just the particular book on your desk but all the other ones like it will be described or ought to be described in the mark record and as we've mentioned then this mark record also needs to include some characteristics of the work and expression and what some of these characteristics are would be uh, the name or names of the creator and contributors. Um, these would be the title. And these would also be um, subject and genre headings. And the reason, also another one would be series headings if the work is in a series.
And that is why Evergreen and other library databases track the uh, entry in those marked fields separately as authority files. Uh, so, let's skip ahead to the next slide here. Okay, so here, it, here is an examination of where some of these elements uh, pop up, like in the different marked fields. So the black text, if you can see my mouse here, is just a reminder of what type of information goes in that marked field. And then we have some colored text here, which shows you what level of the entity or the resource, I should say, is being described. So in field, let's say 100, the author's name traditionally, um, that is the author's name is a uh, is information that exists in a relationship to the work itself and also to the expression. Um, whereas when we go into field 300, the physical description, that is information that primarily relates to this particular manifestation, this particular physical copy or set of physical copies, I should say but that also uh, borrows from the expression as well. So in looking at um, how a mark record is structured then, we want to stop and observe that the authority fields, um, such as 100, um, such as 700 and 730, which are the additional authors. So we have author, additional author, uh, and 13240, which are title added entries, um, become elements of the work itself and are shared across different records. Also, the series information is shared through multiple uh, bibliographic records. And all of this is why we try to standardize this information. We're going to be talking more about fields 130 and 240 uh, in a subsequent uh, PowerPoint lecture here. There is on the, um, on the staff website, there are a couple of cataloging tips of the week that explain a bit more about what fields 130 and 240 are used for in MARG. So if you want, you can take a look at those, but we'll be returning to that discussion here in a, a second lecture that will be announced shortly. Um, let's see here. So, also, something to note here is that the 490 series field is described as containing, element, containing information pertinent to the manifestation, whereas the 8xx series field has information that is pertinent to the work and to the expression. Um, this is, of course, because the information in 490 is the series information as it's taken from the resource itself, as it's printed on the cover, whereas the 800 or the 830 series is locally controlled in our own database and made to be consistent across all series entries, regardless of whether or not the um, title on the cover, the series title on the cover, may vary between entries. So it adds that element of consistency here. Okay, um, another example, and this, oops, this one here is, is Mark formatted. So you can, see, um, you can see a little better how this breaks down. Um, so starting with, let's say here, field 100, uh, Paulo Coelho is um, the author of the work. And the work, let's stop and consider this here for a minute. 
the work is a, uh, a book called Alchemista that was written in um, Portuguese, I believe. That's the work, okay, The Alchemist by Paul Coelho in English is a manifestation of it. So here we use Field 240 to record the original title of a work written in a foreign language. And by original, I mean the title of the work as it is in that foreign language. That is um, one common use of Field 240, although not the only. So it captures, first of all, the original title of the work and then the language into which it has been translated. Only once we've established this relationship between the author and his work, then do we go to Field 245, which records the cover title, The Alchemist, and State of Responsibility, Paul Coelho, semicolon, translated by Alan Clark. So... Alan Clark then appears down here in Field 700 as the translator, or because he is a contributor to the realization of this work through its translation from Portuguese into English. So there we have the work and then the expression, the original novel in a foreign language and its expression in English. And then we proceed to record other details of this manifestation, such as the publisher, the date, uh, the physical description. Um, here in 336, 7, and 8, we have a physical description expressed in RDA vocabulary. So we have the first field, 336, describing the expression of the work as text and then its manifestation as a printed volume. And then a note here for the benefit of patrons and just so we don't lose track of what's going on, that it, this work is a translation and therefore a particular expression. If we had a translation of this work into another language, such as French or German, that would be another expression. And if we had a copy of it in its original Portuguese, that would be its own expression. So you may have noticed that some of the terminology here is unfamiliar. And it has kind of changed as the new, uh, what's called the RDA toolkit, which is the new uh, standards manual. Um, replacing the former um, AACR2 uh, catalogers desktop. So in, in RDA toolkit, which is like catalogers desktop, um, a set of rules to describe how you go about uh, the cataloging process, not specifically a description of how to create a mark record. Um, old term like heading, becomes access point. Note it says here authorized access point because the information that goes in uh, subject headings uh, or name headings is uh, a drawn from or should be drawn from the uh, Evergreen Authority files or the Library of Congress Authority file. We use creator as a catch-all term instead of author, composer, etc. Uh, main entry, you may still hear that from time to time, becomes preferred title. And one thing to observe here is that you can have a title main entry and no author main entry. This is actually um, something you may see in motion pictures where you have no one creator but multiple contributors um, another instance here, uniform title is referred to as a preferred or collective title. Now, in the previous slide where we had field 240, 
for the original title of a work in translation. That is an example of what AACR2 calls a uniform title, or in RDA is called a preferred title. Uh, a uniform title may also be used for an anthology or a compilation. In that is the number two example here of a collective title, such as works, you know, collected works, etc. Uh, we'll talk about that more on another occasion. Uh, so, one thing to point out, the general material designator, um, this is subfield H in 245, where you'll see it recorded large print or uh, sound recording, video recording. That is supposed to be going away in favor of content, media, and carrier type as recorded in fields 336. 337 and 338. Um, however, it's handy for patrons, so we here in SAGE are not getting rid of it just yet. Um, you may not see it in uh, new OCLC records, however, and that is the reason. So this is the um, end of the slideshow here, and I'm going to, I guess, go ahead and pop up on screen here so that I can talk about this briefly. So the PowerPoint that we just went through here is part of what I've been doing and will be continuing to do in the, uh, the live training sessions around uh, in the area. So... Um, we will be having another one of these uh, go-to-meeting teleconferences in possibly um, a week or so. And in that one, we'll be taking some of the ideas that we've discussed here and examining how they play out in the MARC record in more detail, which includes... Um, Examples of using field 240 to record um, a preferred or a collective title for different manifestations of a single expression. Um, also using field 130 to, uh, to do the same, where it, um, the difference being that in 130 you're dealing with a work that has no chief creator or somebody who's primarily responsible. So you don't use field 100 for those records and field 130 becomes the, uh, the main access point in that situation. An example of which I mentioned earlier, uh, the Ocean's Eleven, two different movies uh, made on two different dates. So by creating a you know, 130 title that also has the date in it, you now have uh, two different collective titles, or two different preferred titles. Anyway, um, another thing we're going to be looking at in the next presentation is uh, some more use of the 7XX fields for uh, recording the names of contributors and others. Uh, so we're going to wrap this up now and get the link out to folks here on the email list serve. Hopefully you all enjoyed this and found it um, to be a, a good introduction here. So um, if uh, folks are interested and want to see more of this presentation or others to do with uh, RDA terminology and vocabulary, I get in touch and I'll uh, let you know. So yeah, um, everyone, thanks for watching. and. Uh, I'll see you again soon. Um, let's see here.